So um, how are you? I'm good. I have so many questions for you, and I'm sure that you want to talk to me as well. <laughs> you know what? Hit me with whatever you got. Uh, I mean, my only we'll, we'll bounce back and forth a little bit anyway. Yeah, no, um, sure. Did you want, did you want me to record this or not? For, well, for, so, for your okay, for so, your sake. I mean, do you want do you want the notes for later? Because I, I mean, sometimes because I talk to people like you quite often, and people are like scribbling notes. I was going, you know, we can record. No, this. that that would be. Whoop, sorry, I just broke my pen. That would be great. Okay, um, done. Awesome. Yeah, I am. Um, my my only concern about uh, being on the podcast. Oh is no, I that... don't. I won't publish it if you don't want. Oh yeah, no. Well, I was just telling you, like, I I actually am. I am in complete agreement that there needs to be more dialogue. Um, yeah. between different groups of people who do different things. And one of the things I felt so bad about when we were doing our interviews um, was people saying that when they wanted to ask scientists questions that they felt like they were um, sort of like angry or closed off or they wouldn't respond. I So I'm all about that. However, um, what I don't like is angry emails. I don't have the constitution for it. Awesome. Um, and I've been getting some of those already. And I just know that like the more active publicity or you know me being on your show i right. i just want to kind of avoid some of that oh this, um, this isn't a show by the way this is just you and i talking um oh no, i know this is i the, just meant like putting it or being on a podcast or oh gotcha originally... gotcha gotcha i mean the, i'm i'm just recording the audio part the video part we're not doing anything um yeah no, sure but yeah i get you look it takes a thick skin it really does uh and it's weird because you're on the other side of the fence i mean you're not you're, obviously you're not with us and so the other side of the fence doesn't get that much hate, but ever since that Netflix thing happened, it just went crazy. Who I had no what you know what I'm talking about? Yes, no, of course. No. Yeah, no, I actually met the um, producer and director. Oh, of that. you talked to him? Yeah, no, yeah, I met them at um, at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, um, and I've seen the movie at least three times now. They were I think. the they were at the film festival in Chicago. No, 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 no. It was, um, it was just a, so the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago had a film series. Yeah. And one oh, of yeah, the- yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And Behind the Curve played there. You're absolutely right. In yeah, fact, exactly. it, it yeah. was and, one of the and, last showings before it went into distribution. Yeah. Huh. And um, again, like one of the big things that we were both saying, both the, the director and producer who were there and me- right. Um, and, and that the museum completely supported is it's unfair to say that these people are crazy or stupid. Right. So that was like a big part of what we were talking about um, and, and trying to push that back. Right. So, but I'm getting like, I think in part the, the, so I presented research that was talking mostly about, so we tested um, some of Eric Dubay's arguments, the 200 proofs the earth is not a spinning ball. Sure. Um, just as examples of different types of arguments. So right. there's like religious argument, right? And then there were some of like the experiments that were talked about. Um, and then there were the sort of like uh, conspiracy based experiments talking about like NASA um, uh, editing photos. Right. And so we wanted to see how those differed, well, how people rated those arguments, right? right. What they found was most effective. Um, but one of the things that I had mentioned too was that when we were interviewing people, that almost everybody, had, had found this through YouTube and that it really is a YouTube based community. Oh yeah. And that got turned into, you know, you know, researcher blames YouTube for propagation of flowers. And then I started getting emails from people who like one of them was actually kind of funny. They said that they nominated me for minister of truth, you know, from like 1984, but I wasn't even saying that, that, um, that stuff should be censored or anything. I was just saying that, you know, if we have, you know, people looking for science on YouTube, right. then scientists should take advantage and, and, you know, communicate with people where the people are looking. Right. Um, there were, there were two sides. It was interesting when I saw that story start to blossom because it's weird. You know, the, the media has gotten to the stage now where they don't even have to give credit necessarily to the original article. They just say, oh yeah, some such and such down there. They said, blah, blah, blah. And everyone just rips off each other. And it, yeah, it could have been taken two ways. One was, Okay, were you calling? And I I know where you're coming from. Uh, or were you calling? It's like, look, you want to point the blame at somebody, blame it on YouTube. And the other people were like looking at like, why is this a story? It's the most obvious thing in the world, of course. You mm -hmm. know, to us, it's like, of course, it's on YouTube because there are no other plat. I mean, YouTube is the largest television network in the world now, yeah. and I mean, thousands of lifetimes worth of content 
So it's like, of course, what else would it be? Kind of like if you want to buy weird stuff, you know, odds, odds and ends, you go to eBay. You want to do a search. I mean, Google is now a verb. Yeah, you know, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, so there's certain things, benchmarks that are in there. You want to send money to people, PayPal. You know, it's it's you want to look up uh, movie reviews, Rotten Tomatoes and so on and so on. So, no, I knew when the story came out, but it was interesting that you kind of cats caught some some pushback. But yeah. But at the same yeah. time, it, it was weird because it was it, when it came out, and I know you have questions, uh, which is Congress, you know, the, they met that special session when Google met with um, uh, the United States government last year to talk about the problem of potentially, quote unquote, fake, new, fake news. And out of all the topics they brought up, they brought up Flat Earth, which was interesting. Right. It's like, wow, really? Out of all the things you're going to bring up, you're going to bring up us? And was, but well, that was, sorry, go ahead. To be fair, one thing that I'll say is the reason why they use Flat Earth as an example, yeah. because when you look at Congress and what they're polarized on, right. some of the things right. that they'll fight about, they will actually disagree amongst themselves in Congress. Right. So they right. can't talk about like climate change or vaccines. Or I understand that within the Flat Earth community, there's a lot of pushback on some of those topics as well. Right. But I think that Flat Earth is the one that right now is a small enough community that it is not in Congress. So they can sort of use that as a example of something that they all agree on. You're absolutely right. And that's a good point. Yeah, we have no reps <laughs> anywhere. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, it, yeah, you can't. There, it was funny because uh, in the Flyers community, in fact, there was somebody that was um, pitching a television show recently. And they were saying, oh, should it be an all-inclusive conspiracy show? I go, no. Because there's some conspiracies you can't talk about now, you can't. I mean, the you know, look, watch what happened. Look what happened to Robert De Niro when he tried to release the vaccination movie at his film festival. You know, yeah. Look, you know, no, 9/11 is still touchy. 20 years later, it, it you know, people don't want to talk about it and so on and so on. Anyway, sorry. Questions? What do you have? Oh yeah. Well, so the got? first thing I wanted to do because, and this is what I do too when I'm talking to reporters because I want to make them. I don't want them to take me out of context. Is I want to define conspiracy theory. So when I say conspiracy theory, I'm not using it in a dismissive sense. Right. I'm using it as an explanation right. that involves a group of people who are hiding something for some reason, right? Yeah. So in the Flat Earth community, um, the way that I've heard Flat Earth described is that like NASA, for example, is either covering information up or they're editing photos or they're hiding it in a way. So to me, that's why I would call Flat Earth a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Do you, does, oh, yeah, does that make yeah, sense? yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I, the, the clinical definition of conspiracy is I think it's three people, three people or more from a legal sense. I, I, I can tell you because I have been convicted of conspiracy years yeah. ago because I ran um, a, an illegal fireworks thing out of my university. Whole oh. another story for another time. Very, very interesting. <laughs> but it, because I had three or more people involved, we conspired together interesting to do this thing so that's this whole separate charge like you get you get the the actual crime whatever it is and then if you have other people involved they can tack on conspiracy to it because okay you were working as a group right so, so yeah so when i say that again i just mean you know people no. who are working together as a group no. um so and like i said so i see flat earth is a conspiracy theory in the sense that um much of the explanation is that there are people who are hiding information or sure. that they don't want you sure. to know sure. right um Okay, so some of the people that we talked to um, at the, actually a, a large majority of the people who we talked to at the conference were biblical literalists. Right. So wait, they wait. believe- Oh, you were at Denver. Both. You were so Denver I had, and- Raleigh. So I had research- You were at Raleigh? I didn't, did we talk? No, no, oh. no. My, my research, so I have research assistants who are there. Oh, okay, um, okay. To doing this. Now, um, so, I mean, they talked to Robbie. I talked to Robbie on the phone. Got it, got it, got it. Sometimes. Um, now are, do you can, so I, I don't think I've heard you say that you are a biblical literalist. Are you? <sighs> wow. That's a tough call. Um, literalist kind of, but I know people say, well, you're either you are, or you aren't. And it's like, okay, oh, well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to believe everything. Uh, it's, I don't take it all literal, but there are a lot of things that are very literal to me. Okay. Um, so, but, so but. You but I'm not as I, hardcore as others. Let's put it that way. Right. And so I know um, when we've asked people, um, would you consider yourselves religious? They say no, because for them, 
they equate that term with sort of subscribing to dogma that comes from yeah. like authority in the church. But when, when I say it, I just mean like, do you have some sort of faith based view? So like, um, so, you know, whether like you're Christian or, oh, or yeah, 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 yeah. I, so, but you would consider yourself religious. In oh, that absolutely. Sense? I was raised uh, a strong born again, Christian, you know, uh, church was not just a Sunday thing. We had youth group and vacation Bible school and I went to camp Malibu and so on and so on. And then, you know, it was very, very active. And then I went to university. And by the way, I say university instead of college because outside of the United States, if you didn't already know that, they, yeah. that, that whole thing. I learned that yeah. when I lived up in Canada. It's like, you can't say college. It's like, really? Yeah, I heard you say that. And so I was wondering if you had lived in Canada. Um, I did. I lived in Victoria yeah. for a year. And mm -hmm. that uh, you learned pretty quick. It's like, you know, Not you, you don't yeah. say college is, college is technical college, which is it's interesting. Definitely. America screws up so many little things like that. You know, for us, college and university is literally the same term. So anyway, um, when I left, when I left the island and I went to university for the first time, that's when I realized, like, oh, there's other views, there's other things happening. That the Christianity isn't the only religion in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I fell away from it, and then flat Earth snapped me back into a form of Christianity, but it was different than what it was before. Meaning now okay. I respect the other, the four major religious houses outside of Christianity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, everybody, I think, that, well, you know, I mean, full well, I mean, you've done the stats I, for me and you know, maybe you know some of the numbers more than I do, uh, at least half of the community, at least in the United States are strong Christian. I mean, the, yeah. the conferences and the meetups I have gone to look, they're quoting chapter and verse. Yes. And yeah. So, yeah. Well, and so one of the things that I was curious about, um, with regard to that is, so one of the things that I studied in when I went to university. So I, um, as an undergrad, I, I studied philosophy and then, um, I, I did some biology and, and psychology and communication. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about was epistemology, right? And so that's, uh, you know, what, uh, how we know we know something, right? So what, what types of evidence are convincing to us? Right. And we talk about the different versions of this. We talk about testimony, um, right? So believing something from other people, um, firsthand evidence, right? When you've experienced it yourself, Sure. And then logic and reasoning when you can deduct or induct something right from from evidence. Right. What it seems to me when I've spoken with people, you know, we, when we talk to people from the flat earth community is that there's um, there's a lot of distrust in testimony because there's a recognition that anybody who has who's telling you haven't seen it firsthand. Right. right. So if my you know, if my mom tells me that she saw like a pink bird yesterday, I might like go. I mean, did you, did you really see it? Like, can you, right. there's no way you can prove to me. Um, but one of the things that I think are interesting about the Bible, and this may apply less to you depending on, cause you said like, oh, no, say, no, I can, I can, I can hold my own. Yeah. No but way. yeah, but, um, so, but one of the, one of the questions is, well, like, well, if, if a lot of these institutions and authorities, um, can, can, could be corrupted, might be corrupted or are corrupted. Right. Um, what about the publishing companies that release biblical texts and so how do we know that the bible hasn't been corrupted oh, in similar ways that are you kidding that's an excellent point and that is something that's been covered oh, wow for years and years Crit critics of the bible have talked about that for a long time which is look the bible was technically written published good point you say that published by man you know from the from the roman era i mean come on the holy the from different people too right so you have all sorts of different versions of it you have the king james version and right. you so i mean if if men are involved at all so even you know let's assume that there was a a god sanctioned um uh text right. that could be produced um we clearly know that man can interfere and yep. make information disinformation absolutely right so why do you think in, in your view does the flat earth community and um in particular because we know that uh there's a strong uh population of, of religious or biblical literalists in that right, group right, right. is the bible trustworthy like Most, makes... you're you're and you're correct it is a leap of faith more than more than anything the reason why the flat earth community has jumped on it and really and it's really amazing because it's not just uh catholics versus protestants or right. you know or or christianity versus hinduism buddhism judaism or islam um, because, you know, three of those five share common stories, which is a whole nother thing. Um, it's because out of all the stories from all the texts, there's only one verse in the entire Bible that even hints at the globe. 
that's where it gets interesting. It's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, men publish the Bible, of course. And you can say, well, you know, did men corrupt the Bible? And then you get into like, well, no, God wouldn't let them. I won't even get into that. But if, and I don't know if they've quoted you the chapter and verse, but it's Isaiah forty twenty two. he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the, the religious scholars are quick to point out, it's like, look, circle is not globe. It's not ball. It's not sphere. It's a completely different word in Hebrew. So that's the only verse. Everything else says the same thing in different fashions you know everything from genesis and the firmament to the earth is fixed and immovable versus stuff i talked about in the clues which were i didn't even talk about the story of joshua which uh says you know he asked god to hold the sun and the moon in the sky for an extra day so he could kill more people and god just said oh yeah sure i'll do that and he did uh or of course my favorite which was the tower of the babel a tower of babel which is tower of babel which is supposedly the bridge to heaven where is that going on a spinning ball that's going in five different directions if it's this flat stationary earth with some sort of dome structure, well, it's going to the roof, plain and simple. You, comp you compile all those together, and there's some great websites out there. That my favorite is um, testingtheglobe.com by Rob Skiba, who you probably heard of. And it, everybody says that the book is a flat earth Bible, at least the Christian side. It doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's the Catholic version or the Protestant version or anything else. And since the first five books of the Bible were basically ripped from the Torah, you know, and, uh, you know, Genesis through through um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deut Deuteronomy. Uh, I can never pronounce that word. The, um, where am I getting it is, the, the reason why, sorry, short version, the leap of faith is because there's nothing to contradict it. It doesn't matter if man published the book or not. The, it seems to be that no matter what they published, whoever published it, there's lots of flat earth references in it. Uh, and if there's only one against, and again, if it wasn't for that one, it would get way worse than what you're seeing right now. I mean, there are, there are pastors out there which are using that Isaiah verse as veto power against the rest of the Bible. I mean, it's like, no, this verse contradicts everything else. It's like, really, Isaiah? That's Genesis over there. Sorry. That only works, too, if you take a literal interpretation of the Bible. Right. 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 Well, so which, a lot, which a lot do. And, and right. come on. The, what, so what happened was the flat earth, this may help you a little bit. The flat earth reinforced the Christian, well, all religions, but we'll only pick on Christians, the Christian belief. So if they were 90% sure that mm -hmm. they, you know, that the Bible is, you know, that God is real, and yet something built us, flat earth takes them a, to like 97 or 98%. It's like, well, it doesn't seem like that much. Well, it is though. That, I mean, mm -hmm. it takes it to the point where now even there's like a, there's, there are, there are feuds now within the Christian community in flat earth. Saying right. you have to follow this book and this, you know, they're they're actually drawing lines in the sand now, saying, okay, mm -hmm. we've already proven this this how far it's gotten. Where it's like we've already proven that the world has been created, God exists. Therefore, these texts have to be followed. I mean, it, it's literally you watch the movie several times. That Monty Python reference was no joke, and I was I didn't ask them to put it in. I'm glad they did though, because it uh -huh. really set. It's like that's how much conviction now has been added. It's it's almost like flat Earth added jet fuel to the uh the all the, the major houses of religion mm -hmm. so does that kind of help yeah no that's that's really interesting um so the other thing that i wanted to ask about is sort of the trustworthy of science mm. trustworthiness of science right. so i mean it, when i was at the museum of science and industry in chicago one of the first questions that i asked the audience was how many of you completely trust the government <laughs> right how many of you completely trust pharmaceutical companies right. how many of you completely trust corporate and i mean clearly there are situations in which people don't trust right. um, these because they you know they they view too that there are going to be situations in which profit or power right. um are, are are overtaking right. but um there are I mean, there are a lot, I mean, I'm not, I can, I, I don't know if you'll believe me, but I can tell you I'm an independent scientist. I mean, I work for a university in the South, in the middle of the Bible Belt. Sure. I'm allowed to kind of study what, what I want to, what I want to study. And, um, you know, how, how do I, well, I guess this is sort of two questions. Um, one is that, you know, I think anybody who lives in our society or our world um, uses some science and we, we trust, so we trust some things, right. but we're not trusting others. And sort of what, in your view, can scientists do to help increase their own trustworthiness? You know, assuming that they're, they're, they're trying to in on, like honestly, you know, answer questions and, and put their information out there where people can understand it. Boy, that's a tough one. And it's not the first time it's been asked to me. And I've been trying to think of different ways to answer this because as you know, uh, science, Look, we li the, the problem isn't just science. It's everybody else around science. 
So, of course, we all know that there's lies everywhere. People lie for their own benefit. Yeah. And it's mostly because of our competitive nature as human beings. I mean, we will, I mean, just take the first four off the top of your head. You know, business, politics, sports, entertainment, people lie. I could, I could give you, I could spend all day on sports and some on entertainment. Or politics isn't even worth talking about because, I mean, look up, you know, politicians, mm -hmm. like crooked politicians. Like, it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, but with science, for a long time, they were integrity, right? But, and, and you've probably heard this term before, and that is they ended up, though, like anybody else, they took, a leap, took leaps of faith when they realized that people will just believe whatever science stamps, rubber stamps. It's, and the, the great line by Neil Tyson, which is one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard outside of Kanye, which is science is right whether or not you believe in it. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, if you, you know, you're telling me what the boil, and you've heard me probably say this before, which is, you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? Sorry, my ride's here. The, um, uh, the, uh, the boiling temperature of water at sea level, um, that's fine. I can test that right now. You want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like? Uh, no, 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 not a chance. And, and in fact, back in the day, they used to even put in small print below that big cross section of the earth, you know, showing all the colorful bands leading to the white center. It, you know, oh, basically, we have no idea what's going on down there. But then at some point, they removed that, that text. And now it's like, okay, you show that to a nine year old, and then, you know, he graduates. What do you think? It's like, oh, yeah, that's what the core of the earth looks like. The deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles. So can I actually, can I pause here for a second? So this is one um, part of that. So back to that sort of like epistemology question, yeah. um, you know, people reason about what's in the center of the earth. Sure, of course. Right. And so based on things like volcanoes, right? So when you have lava come up through volcanoes, sure. they believe that there's sort of a hot molten surface. And so are you just saying that it's the certainty? It's, that it, it's they, they, what they, science never does. And I, and I get it. I, I totally get it because, you know, they're supposed to, people look to them. People have been looking to versions of scientists throughout the ages. It's like, tell us wise man, why this is this, you know, and they just like, well, I speculate, blah, blah, blah. But if you say that long enough, eventually you just pull out the word speculate. And then you say, it's this, right? They science, find me a science book where you see a giant question mark in the middle of something like the core of the earth. That's what it should be. The core of the well, earth should be a big question mark. And it's not. I mean, taught, for example, to use very mitigating language, because when we do research, you know, some things are conditional under certain circumstances. Right. I mean, particularly when you're doing work about behavior, like right. I do, right? Human right. behavior. It's always condi conditional and contextual and dependent on a whole bunch of different right. sort of right. circumstances. Right. Um, now, I'll agree that sometimes... Well, first of all, whenever we try to talk to the general population about that, right. by using that sort of mitigating language, they think we're lying. <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, lying. And it's it's kind of like the what is it the the few apple uh, rot, few few apples rot, rot, ruin the whole bunch type thing. Of course, you know, there's lots of great. Science. I'm sure you were a wonderful person, and I would never accuse you of being anything. Oh no, I'm not even know, talking, yeah. Probably in, integrity to the, I probably can't even gaze upon you directly, but at the same <laughs> time between like media covered science and then if you're like reading in academic journals if we're being precise sometimes that's perceived as being um like uh like trying to purposefully hide information with right. jargon but often jargon's used just to be precise but if we oversimplify then we are lying right because we're we're broadly generalizing something that's that's not true what, um what, so i think it's such a struggle in science com oh absolutely absolutely it, it is uh i the the I would say transparency would be the solution, but that's almost impossible because, look, sci this is going to sound like a horrible statement, but scientists need Porsches too. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of scientists when they go into the private sector that oh, right. take the money to manipulate data so that a product, look, shareholders are shareholders. That has not changed in a long, long time. And you, a scientist, you know, they go to them and say, look, you've got to publish this because, you know, you've got to make these results do this so our product can do this. And then bad things happen. Uh, you're going all the way back to, oh, my God, uh, lead paint, lead gasoline, uh, DDT, all the versions of DDT. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know, sure. asbestos. And by the way, I, I love asbestos as a product. Asbestos is a fantastic <laughs> thing. Does a lot of great things. Unless you work in the factory, then you're dead. Right. Uh, well, and, and like uh, smoking, the same thing. Oh yeah, the um, smoking thing. Yeah. Have you heard of the open science framework? No. Okay, so Google this um, when you have a chance. See, okay. that's me using it as a verb. OSF.io, 
And it's something that I, I think it's not currently happening in industry, right. but this is a big push in the sciences. It's, it's called an open science framework. And the idea is to increase more openness and transparent, more openness and transparency right. in science, including pre-registering kind of like what we're planning on doing. So we're not changing things after the fact. Right. Um, so I, I think that I would hope that that sort of thing too can help increase trustworthiness of oh, science. Uh, potentially, sure, sure, no, no question. The the here's why science gets linked up with the flat Earth because we let's cut to the chase here. Um, science, the reason why science gets hammered so badly with flat Earth is because the issues that we're talking about with are geologic and astrophysic and the other things, and Motion. so by yeah, default you, you've got your scientists tied to it. Now, again, we're not talking about giant conspiracy. People will say, well, you know, are all scientists lying? You know, this huge cover-up with millions of people, every space agency, every scientist, uh, every astronomer. It's like, no, 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 no. It's so big that most 99% of the people don't know anything because they wouldn't. Uh, you know, all the wrench turners at NASA, you know, 90, people that, that build fuel systems and polish capsules and all this, they don't know anything. I, heck, I live next to um, what the garage mechanic at NASA, not not exaggerating here. His name was Wayne Ottinger. Knew all the Apollo and Mercury and Gemini guys on a first name basis. His walls were just bristling with plaques from NASA. He knew nothing about nothing because he just turned a wrench. You know, he built the freaking things. He built the the lem and all that. So why why would you have to tell him? You wouldn't. Uh, right. Science science gets bashed because you got to bash somebody. <laughs> In this case, somebody somebody. If it's a conspiracy, then somebody is lying. All right, who do you go after? Right. NASA would be the first thing. And since NASA, I'm not going to say NASA is the poster child for science. It's not. But they paint themselves as that because they want yep. to make themselves, even though they are fully military, you know, the it, everybody in there is. The space program sort of popularized science in a way. Exactly. It did. Absolutely. Yeah. Between it, the, it was a it was a great culminative, culminative, cumulative effort where, you know, you had National Geographic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and NASA and uh, all the other science public, you know, popular science, they all went together into this. And and once once the whole moon mission was proposed and did that in the 60s and 70s, that was like the peak of science, even though which is weird because you'd think that other right. things in science would be the better things, better thing to humanity. More like science fiction in the sense that people have always thought about like walking on the moon or floating and, you know, so I, I think it's, it it's one of those exciting things that, oh, that yeah. seems really far fetched. Yeah, and, um, and it catches the public eye. Look, the public. Uh, here's the other thing that why science is catching such hell compared to us is sorry, real quick, and I and I know you got a lot of questions. Uh, oh yeah. Which is, um, people, and I've I've just heard this so many times over the years. People don't want to learn; they want to be entertained. So if science has yeah. something entertaining people will watch it. And the only thing in science that's really entertaining has something to do with the space program. And even that's been losing its luster for a long time because or there's no psychology. people involved. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, the bad psychology findings too, yeah. that um, they get tons of media play because it's like weird or crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't told... want to know about a vaccine. Well, I mean about, you know, different biological things. I mean, th look at all your other, you know, geology, hydrology, biology. Yeah. Nobody cares about that stuff. And, since, right. and now because the, the media spectrum has gotten so broad, yeah, you mm -hmm. try to, in fact, somebody asked me recently, they said, how could, you may ask this eventually, how could, what could science do to make a better push into the general public? And I said, well, the problem is that, I mean, yeah, back in the day when there were only three television stations, you could do something like Schoolhouse Rock and trick kids into learning, right? And even the parents that would be like listening over their shoulder. But that was then. Nowadays, I, I don't even know how many hundreds of television channels, let alone let alone internet stuff. I mean, there's literally thousands of lifetimes worth of media out there. You could spend $10 billion and create your own version of Schoolhouse Rock and push it out to everything from Netflix to YouTube to, to every television station. But, uh -huh. it would, but then you would have people analyzing that. And people, it's, well, why, you know, it, it would come off as desperate. And mm -hmm. so anyway, so go ahead. Question. No, no problem. Um, so one of the things that, that you said in the documentary yeah. and that we heard from other flat earthers as well, right. is right. that they said that science can't debunk it. Right. Right. And that when you guys tried to start, you, many of you said that um, you saw the recommendations or, 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 you know, you heard about it yeah. and you went through a process of trying to debunk it. Right. Well, I was really curious um, sort of to hear about that process like oh. where are you looking for information what sort of things were you questioning 
everybody and that's that, thank you for asking that uh because it, it was touched on in the movie but but daniel didn't want to turn it into a nuts and bolts movie which would yeah, have, which would of- which would have taken it too long anyway i appreciate that he was trying to go to the human interest piece and just so you know because we've only been talking about this recently in the community because he let it slip in the itunes director's commentary was that the reason why he tweaked it against us was because of that single thing. And I don't know if you saw, or no, you had research assistants in, in Raleigh, I think, which was when that 12-year-old kid walked up to the microphone. Mm-hmm. And I have mm-hmm. heard this now. I even heard it on an interview I did last night where it's hardcore science people are like, yeah, that bothered me. And it's like, well, look, we're not recruiting. It's not like we're, we're big tobacco with Joe Camel. We, got, we have no special program for the kids. Look, he, he came up. I mean, I'm talking to, after I'm done with you, uh, by the way, we, we, we have like an hour and a half left. If it, I mean, before, I don't mean, know how long you want to, because then I have a high school literally right after you. And then I have a high school tomorrow and a high school. There's some call uh, high school in uh, Chicago wants to fly me out. Daniel would probably okay. just cringe if he heard any of this stuff. Anyway. So, can I ask you real quick, brief tangent? Um, so there are ones that are flying you out. These are people who want you to explain your views to the students because they uh, subscribe to them or is it some that of the they kids subscribe to them yeah. and some of the kids just find it interesting so okay. they yeah, I, was... I mean look that that the, the u.gov survey which i'm sure you've heard about by now yeah you go mm-hmm. yeah you, the u.gov survey uh when they were talking about the 18 to 24 year olds how you know a third of them were were like not really okay. buying the globe anymore no that yeah. was in the part that that got me the part that got me which was left completely out of the survey and nobody even talked about in the articles was the 12 to 17s the 12 to yeah. 17s are worse we can't we can't, we can't uh, legally talk to them right without parent parental consent, exactly which... exactly and yeah. so i i kind of joked about well i wasn't joking i was i kind of poking at one of my, one of the troll channels out there and I said, you know, because they were saying, you know, stay away from the children. I go, I go, I'm sorry, it's too late. <laughs> we, we already have them. But, but that's a whole other thing for another time. Okay, so to your, to your point uh, about people that go into, because, yeah, I hated Flat Earth. Everybody starts in the negative, which should show you how strong this thing is, which is nobody goes into it loving it. Everybody hates it. Me, I mean, it took me nine months. I looked at the recommendation. I said, this is the stupidest thing ever. And I had a literally a visceral response when I first clicked on it. I, it was like, in fact, I was, I was shocked. It was like, it was like, why am I getting embarrassed about clicking on a flat earth? I mean, literally flushed. And I was going, I've clicked on some weird stuff in the internet. Everybody has. And there never bothered me. This thing bothers me. And then <clears throat> when you try to debunk it, you go to the obvious things first. Everybody does the, f- the same thing. It's a knee jerk reaction. You go to space. You look uh, up of images of the Earth from space. You look. You go into the space programs. You start looking at stuff, and you start comparing what other flat earthers are saying. And you're staring at the images, and then you start, you know, l- images of satellites from space, and then start dabbling in physics. I mean, my God, I've learned so many silly scientific factoids in the last five years, more than I've ever retained in in university. And the more you do, and there, there, you think you can because we have kind of like a shotgun pattern approach to flat earth you know there's all these different facets right you may be able to knock down a few or heck if you're confident or overconfident you think you knock down quite a few but there's still some to get through and those keep nagging at you and the more you try to hammer them down there you know it just gets worse and worse and worse to where finally out of frustration the usual turnaround time now is about two weeks that's usually the incub- the incubation one, period sorry go when ahead. you were when you were debunking, which ones did you were you able to sort of knock down, and which ones pushed through for you? Um, the ones that, and again, knock down is probably isn't even the best word. It was just that it right. was like well, I, I was I was satisfied enough that it was probably a globe with these aspects, but there were too many. But but for those little handful, there were way too many more that got through. So like right. for example, um, the ones that I didn't like, and I still don't like because it's because we don't know. You know, we're still trying to work it out. Would be like the Antarctic sun. You know, 24 hour sunlight that's yeah. it's got to be one of the biggest um what exactly is the iss even though that could very well be a military operation uh how the how the sun and the moon work exactly yeah. because we're talking about a blend now of projections and software and i was in the mm-hmm. software industry for a lot of years and once you get into software development and regardless if you play games or not or go into simulations or not and i was into the whole simulation thing since its infancy i know what's possible uh there we can do a lot when it comes to that so then all of a sudden again you start going 
because there's no concrete blocks to stand on, it's like you're jumping around a lot of different things and it starts to start blur together. So mm -hmm. fine, the Antarctic sun, how the sun and the moon work. Yeah, I may have problems with those, but there's too many other questions like gravity versus the vacuum of space uh, the, and everything that NASA has done. Again, because you're leaning on the space agency, that's the part that falls apart. That, that's the thing right. that falls apart first, which is Apollo. Everybody starts with, okay, we went to the moon. Obviously, if we went to the moon, it's a globe. And then you start looking at the moon stuff. And because, it, by the way, a lot of this wasn't because of what we did. It was because of all the years. People have been downing the freaking moon missions since the moon missions. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I mean, all the way back in the 70s, people were doubting those. But yeah. before the internet, what are you going to do? You're going to go to little conventions and the UFO. It's usually just a booth at a UFO convention. Nobody really you know, paid it much attention. And then once the internet came out, people started sharing notes. And the, the moon mission was, had been torn down for so long. So all of a sudden you have a bunch of flat earthers that are referencing anti-moon stuff that had been mm -hmm. built up for 20 years. And that, once you go there, that's a huge jumping off point. It's like, heck, I've had people, weird, I've had people that were into conspiracies that said, that don't believe in flat earth. They said, fine, Apollo is a piece of trash, never happened. But you can't tell me the ISS is fake. And I thought, wow, that's some weird logic. I go, and you realize that if they fake one thing, you fake it all. You know, it's that's crime 101, which is uh, because the penalty is the same. It's it's I'll use a movie reference. Like, look, if you're going to shoot one guy, you might as well shoot them all, because if you get caught, you're going to you know, you're going to get life anyway. So <laughs> why would you why would you make anything real if the one part of it's fake? It's it's just what you do. And then after that, it just snowballs. Um, after that, you start looking at long distance photography uh, and after that, you start looking into little things in physics, you know, like, again, gravity versus the vacuum of space. Yeah, can I ask you about that real quick? What? So one of the things, so we did ask people about um, what their concepts of gravity was. Oh, yeah, it's all would, over the place. Yeah, and I would, I would love to ask you about yours. Mm. So can you tell me a little bit about the, the gravity versus the vacuum of space thing? What is gravity to okay, you? Gra is okay, gravity is, okay, the scientific explanation, again, I'm going to pick on Neil Tyson real quick. Which, <laughs> okay, so, so Neil Tyson, he, uh, he said that we can't tell you what gravity is. We can only tell you what it does. We can only tell you the symptoms of gravity, and all scientists will tell you this, because they can't replicate it. It's not like, now, if we could generate a unified field, then, yeah, maybe we could you know, do some sort of gravity thing. But gravity is just some molecular magnet that pulls things down. And if you're a globalist, well, it pulls it down to the center of a globe. And if you're flat, or at least me, it just pulls it straight down. Period. That's all there is. Now, there are some people in Flat Earth that'll say, well, it's buoyancy. Because, yes, you can get the same sort of effect with buoyancy. We all know this with water, for example. You take a, a beach ball and you put it underwater and you let it go. It's going to pop up to the surface. Why? Because of buoyancy. Um, but buoyancy only goes so far. And you can't, you can't use buoyancy as the absolute end all, especially in, in a pressurized system like this, because uh, if you're in a closed container, <laughs> like an airplane, and you're, you know, you're going straight up in a, in a you know, pull up on a plane, well, you're in a sealed capsule. So it's not buoyancy that's pushing you back into your seat. It's something else. It's some sort of molecular magnetic force, which is known as gravity. Could it be a combination of the two? Sure. But gravity, in my opinion, does gravity exist? Yes. Uh, could it be a mixture of both? Yes, because if it's a pressurized system, then both play on each other. Sure. Why not? Uh, the, it, and by the way, that's the other thing. Uh, the argument, you know, gravity versus the vacuum of space, which is law of thermal dynamics, which is pressure, uh, uh, pr pressure needs a container. You know what I mean? You can't have uh, an atmosphere without without some sort of container, be it soft or it hard or whatever. We see that you know, from a can of spray paint to a balloon to whatever else you can come up with, right? You know, pressure needs a container. What's the container on Earth? Exactly. In fact, there's only two things I've ever seen that defy that law of thermal thermodynamics. Dynamics. One, of course, is the Earth, because, well, if, if it's not... If it's not a container, where is the bleeding edge? There, cut to the chase. Where is the bleeding edge of our atmosphere to the vacuum of space? And I have talked to vacuum experts that absolutely say, and, and you, you can watch videos on this on YouTube, which the, the power of a vacuum versus non-vacuum is violent. It's extreme. It's instant. There is no middle ground. There is no bleeding edge, right? That does not happen. And so we're talking about a little tiny ball, a little rock with a wispy smoke around it in a vast, vast room entirely made out of vacuum. 
how does that smoke stay on there? How does that little atmosphere stay on there? The other thing, sorry, uh, real quick, which is uh, how, um, sorry, the other thing is the spacesuit, which is, again, defies, and look up, the, the part that bugged me a whole bunch was uh, the uh, spacesuit had, the, the early versions of the spacesuit of NASA, when you, you can look at them, you, the videos are fascinating. That when yeah, they, before. When they were building them, the early versions were plastic and metal and boxy because pressure needs a container, right? And all of a sudden they realized, like, yeah, we're never going to be able to get into a capsule with these damn things. They could barely even walk. You know, they were basically robot suits, you know, big, clunky, freaking robot suits. And then somebody came up with, with genius, freaking, I don't know who this guy was. I hope he's lived and died well, which is, let's just do a soft suit, film it. Nobody knows anything about physics anyway. It'll work. It'll totally work. And it did. It was perfect. I mean, every, everyone was like, oh, if you, all you had to do is shoot it. And it's like, oh, yeah, look, people are walk, bending articulation points. Their fingers could move, playing golf, hooking up electronics. Well, it was on television. It's absolutely real. And that was brilliant. I mean, kidding. The law of thermodynamics says that it would have been a, uh, they would have turned into parade floats. They would have been completely stiff. You ever see that movie um, uh, Christmas Story? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Remember the kid when he was put up in those winter yeah. coats? It's like I can't put my arms down. That would have been exactly what would have happened. I mean, they would have been stiff as a board because the suit would have been fighting him the entire time. Can I put you on mute for one second? Okay. Anyway, so does that so, so that kind of how it's a long version of how I got yeah. to it? But everybody goes down that same sort of road, and there's like they'll pick on space, they'll pick on physics, they'll pick on. Um, so mostly then, do, what, so one thing that I, I just want to clarify that um, so. You talked a little bit about the the points that you were looking into. Right. Were you right. mostly looking at this just all over the web, or on yeah. YouTube specifically? Or no, just no, no, no. Any anywhere I could. Uh, in fact, yeah. when I was looking, though, it was different than most people. I mean, most people now, yeah, the turnaround time is about two weeks. Uh, when I was looking, there wasn't that much out there, even right. though we're only talking about four years ago. And so, in fact, I even joined uh, one of the Flat Earth Societies just out of desperate. It's like, oh, maybe these guys know what's ha what's happening. And then I realized, oh, these guys are terrible. They, they're not doing it. I mean, they're they're the old guard, which they, it's, it's stunning to me even now. They don't reach out to us. And I don't know who they are and what they do. Yeah. It blows, it blows my mind. It's like, really? You're just going to sit there? In fact, they called us. The first time I got contact with them was like 18 months after the clues were released. And it's like, oh, yeah, support it. You know, like what you're doing. Blah, blah, blah. I go, where have you been? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're ripping it up out there. We are just, I mean, it, and I, I was as blunt as I could. I said, look, no offense, but we don't need you at this right. point. We're, we're Flat Earth 2.0. Social media, we don't even need a website, technically, right. to do this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what else you got? Um, no, so uh, one, thing, one thing more I want to say about gravity. So one of my dogs has allergies. Yeah. Um, so when I learned about gravity, I didn't learn about it as a force that pulls down. Right. I took physics class, right? I learned it as um, that bodies have mass, mm -hmm. and that mass is attracted to one another, right? Right. And so um, the the location of bodies in space sure. and you know atmosphere and other things are are pulled in towards the center of mass, right? Got so it. Towards got the it. Got it. Got it. Um, and so I guess I was wondering, do you see that as still consistent with the view that you're looking into, um, like the problems with, with gravity? So not necessarily as a force pulling down, right? But as, 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 as an attraction, right? Is like, yeah, like I mean, it, that, that matters. No, no, it's, it doesn't change it at all. Uh, okay. in fact, uh, in, in something like this, if you use mass, it's like fine. Then the, the flat world has mass and then pulls it down. Although, if you want to go into a completely different thing, which is the whole simulation side, which I don't delve into very much because the average person, unfortunately, our civilization is never going to be able to understand that easily. Uh, there's nothing nothing you can do. It's, we read about it a lot, yeah. It's, 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 too, it's too hard to explain to somebody. You have to know something about software. You have to know something well, also. Well, I think the Matrix, actually, so when I was in philosophy, yeah. um, like the Matrix had come out just a year before. Oh. And, and it really sort of, guys, hush. Sorry, it, it really sort of changed the way people come here. It really sort of changed the way that that people were able to envision, um, like what that means, right? right? So how it, you know it, to? Did you I, ever I, so see I, the movie that came out just before that called The Thirteenth Floor? I don't know. Maybe you not. Really should look into that one if you get a chance. And here's look. The, 
and I've said this on, on several other things, but I'll, I'll tell you, which is there are three things that just scream simulation, and uh, but they're all extremely complex to uh, to understand. One, of course, is the double slit experiment, which not the not the old version, but the new version with the single electron gun stuff, um, mm -hmm. quantum uh, entanglement. I don't even want to get into that right now. And then, of course, the weird one, if you ever have, get a chance to look it up, would be um, neuroscience versus free will, which is a whole yeah. nother thing. It's like, what do you mean you can predict the, the outcome eight seconds before? It's like, because then you're talking about predestination, which science is, oh, that doesn't exist. And it's like, then you're not even talking about a virtual world as much as you're talking about a virtual movie. And that would be... I hate to say it because again i've been in it long enough that would be the most efficient way to go basically what i'm saying is short short version for you and again we can go into other things which is you plan out your path in advance you play the game in advance right and then you just set up a memory block and so that it never ever happened and i'll give you the uh, like a real world version of this which would be let's say you're the director of a movie right you direct this fantastic movie, right? And, you know, you make it exactly the way you want. Forget about the producers and their notes. You direct it exactly the way you want. And then just before you watch it on screen, you erase the memory that you made it in the first place. You, as mm -hmm. the director, will think it's the greatest thing ever because it absolutely clicks into It's like, wow, I would have done that. I would have done, this is the greatest movie ever. Because you and and in fact and you won't, don't put the credits on, so you don't know who who directed it. You would think it was the greatest thing ever, right? That's kind of what uh, neuroscience and free will is kind of hinting at, which is at least in my opinion, which is that everything predestination that would be the way to go. You combine that with a double slit experiment, but again, try to explain that to the average person on the street. You can't. I have to start with something really, really basic, which is okay. You can't even just say it's a simulation. It's if it's enclosed. It, forget about the simulation. If it's enclosed, then and flat, that's where you start. Right. So. Well, what do you think? So um, this is getting off topic a little bit. Right. Um, what do you think about the difference between a rule based world and predestination? Right. So is it technically predestination if you can predict the outcome because you know what the rules are? Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the, technically. All right. Well, all right. Isn't that kind of six of one, half a dozen in the other? I mean, if, you, if you've got a, if you've yeah, got a. Do no. you think it like, is it? I, it's kind so, of. It's think, think, okay. About. Okay. Wait. 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 Okay. This this will help. You remember in the Matrix? You watched the whole trilogy, right? Yeah. Okay. You remember in the second one where Neo and they there was a lot of deep stuff in the Matrix. They did not go into. I mean, people thought it was too cerebral by the time they got to the end. No, no. Whoever wrote They're that. And by the way, whoever wrote that the, the rumor it was not written by the Wachowski brothers. They bought it from right. some whoever yeah. that woman was, and they just slapped their name on it because you can do that when you buy it. It's like no, it was written by us because we wrote them a check. Um, but when he was talking to the Oracle, one of the last times in that park, and uh -huh. he goes, it's the question of choice. And, um, he goes, I can't, I can't shoot. I can't make that choice. And she goes, you didn't come here to make the choice. You already made it. You're here to understand why you made it. Yeah. And I thought that, and I, and I didn't get that for a while. I mean, I was, why well, I'm going, what does that mean? And then as I got more into, because my software was still in its infancy back then. And as I'm, I was going, oh yeah, you, a rule-based world, sure, right? You go a flow chart is what you're talking about here. A rule, it's like, okay, if this, then this, then this, then this, and it's like, well, of course, you know, you know where it's going to go because you know the rules that are set out. What's the difference between between at that point? Yeah, fine, you know that what the path, what each path is going to lead to, and now my head's starting to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> But no, what's the difference is, between doing that? And again, no different than we've seen this many, many times in YouTube. There are kids now that don't even play video games. They watch videos of kids playing video games. <laughs> That's really what we're talking about here. Uh, and, and they get full enjoyment out of it. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, they don't even have to play them anymore. They just watch other. So what's the difference? Imagine the kid that recorded that game, then forgot he did it, had blow to the head, amnesia. He'd be like, yeah, yeah wow. He's doing exactly what I was, anyway, sorry. I'm, I'm rambling on. No, no, I totally, no, I, that was just sort of, I think, um, you know, even within the scientific community, we talk a lot about, um, you know, so in, in some ways there's still this religious influence within right. the scientific community that says people are, um, people are different, right. right? People are different than the other rules that we have in this world. Right. And so if we could use our DNA 
and our brain chemicals or our neuroscience. And if we could use all this stuff to technically predict our action, right. then what, what makes it hard to determine, right? I mean, why isn't it not already technically predestination or why is it not, um, like what makes it different? And the, um, I do, I do believe that people are actually arguing about that. I don't yeah. think that, that that's settled. Um, but one, one argument that says, well, here's how you, well, here's what makes that different than like predestination is the interaction between those forces, right? right? right. So you only have free will until you interact with somebody else. <laughs> so, but if you, if all the decisions that you make are predictable based on like, let's say your, your biology, right. for example, um, well, other people's things are predictable too. But when those two things interact, that's what changes the, now, the nature of the Now system. you're getting into the adjustment bureau argument, which is... Oh. Yeah, but I don't, I don't even think necessarily like the, but not the adjustment bureau specifically, but just the idea that, um, that you can predict people's behavior, but where things get complicated is when they interact with other people. Well, no, not well, boy, now you're getting into game theory, which is, <laughs> and I, I don't want to necessarily get into the spooky stuff, but yeah. Okay. So you have free will, right? Uh, which again is the argument to start and then you run into another person with free will which also by the way assumes that there may be things walking around us that don't have free will mm -hmm. which in any it's a whole nother thing which any simulation and every software developer it's like look you need an army of npcs doesn't matter how many people are in it you need an mm -hmm. army of npcs no offense to the people that are out there but look nobody wants to be a dry cleaner for 30 years and, and sit there. They, they don't. I, there are some people like dry cleaners are probably crying right now if they're listening to this. Uh, so, yeah, we, th that's the big question. But to, to, to the defense on that is, again, if both paths were chosen in advance, basically you played it out, you know, mm -hmm. where, okay, our path, you and I, our path is going to cross and our interaction is going to sp spin off potential things. No, you just say, all right, when when we hit this point, I go here, you go here, and then it deals from that. But yeah, I know. I know what you're saying. And yeah, no, that, I just it think, gets... I think it's interesting. Yeah. That's not even like something I have an opinion on. I just think it's interesting. Oh, no, it's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, so one of the other things I wanted to ask you, um, and this is, I think, one of the last things. So um, if I wanted to be a flat earther, right. um, and I'm thinking, well, you know, so I want to approach or I want to look at this evidence. Now... A couple of the things that are used or I've heard of as as being evidence, um, I, I can't buy just because of my personal experience, right? right? Have you right. ever sent up a weather balloon? Me personally? Yeah. No. So we oh, no, I mean, the community has, sure, but not me. But, but you personally, no, right? No. Community aside. No. Um, so you know, I've sent up a weather balloon with the Atmospheric Sciences Department sure. and has seen the curvature of the Earth using that. Sure. And... Um, the other thing is I have, now this is not me personally, but I've had multiple friends in science right. who have gone to Antarctica. Sure. So one, my friend Natasha just got back from Antarctica. She studies, she's a biologist and right. she studies ecosystems. Right. And right. so she spent, um, I think three months down in Antarctica. Yeah. And then my friend Michael actually is part of, he works at, um, a university in Pennsylvania yeah. and they do these tours where one of the faculty members go with. And they bring a bunch of pe like just regular people right. will go on these tours and they, they went to Antarctica and, and so, and I mean, granted that, like, you know, any pictures that he sent me could have been fake or whatever, but like, Oh no, no, uh, I believe he was there. I believe the yeah. images he was taking were real. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, they, it's from the images, not an ice wall and it's not all ice. There's, there's dirt. Right. Um, they, they didn't have 24 hour sun there. They had 18 hours right now. <laughs> so yeah. they, they got back February 8th. Right. Um, but, but I mean, it just changes depending on the time of year. So I, I think like, you know, I wonder, um, so I, well, some of the people say, well, you can't go to Antarctica if you're not a Freemason, but that's not oh technically my God. true. I, by, right? by the way, the rumor mill in the Flattery community is rampant. I mean, the, yeah. I, I, simple points get twisted to where now it's like, I mean, I've heard that. It's like, no, you go to Antarctica, you're dead. They'll shoot you dead right then and there. It's like, really? They have, they have cruises to Antarctica. Yeah, that you I can know. Go to. Yeah. Um, so, but my, my last question actually is about the rumor mill. Cause I wanted to ask you yeah. about, um, 
I, I was so struck by this and I wish there was more information about what? it, um, about you being the subject of a conspiracy yourself. Mm, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? What's that like? Of course. How does that make you feel? Of course. No, no, no. And it's not that the, the, one of the drawbacks of being, of doing this is that you are, for lack of a better word, cultivating at least the core group, which is already extremely suspicious of everything. You combine that with a competitive nature, and that's how the whole thing started, was, again, we're competitive about anything. Look, people will discredit other people in, in a blink of an eye. Uh, everybody, uh, I've seen this in YouTube many times, even though I don't consider myself a, a, a YouTube um, hardcore guy compared to other people. If you, once you see your, you know, because people, they treat it like a score, right? My subs. All of a sudden you see somebody that's got 10,000 more subs than you, you squint and you're like, okay, what's this guy up to, right? And you're immediately suspicious of them. When it came to me, the whole thing started when I was, it was back in 2015, Eric Dubay of all people. God, mm -hmm. Eric. He, his movie uh, get cut into short segments. That's why we use his. But, the what? Sorry, go ahead. I said his his video was just easy to cut into. Oh yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The only reason why we use Eric. Him. Oh, yeah. What what happened was people want to be. Um, everybody wants to rule the world, and Eric and Matt. They were the new to know. They contacted me both almost immediately, uh -huh. and Matt. Or I'll, I'll use Eric first. Where Eric, in fact, Eric and I officially have never spoken. To this day, he would send his minions to me, and this minions like after like I was I'd only done my third interview at that point, and now I, I I've lost count. It's hundreds. Uh, and he and and his minions said Eric's not very happy with you. Uh, he wants you to not mention the Orlando Ferguson map anymore, and he doesn't want you to use uh, Crow Triple Seven's moon footage anymore. And if you don't do this, he's going to start to discredit you. And I'm like. I have no idea who Eric is. Honestly, it's like, okay, one, yeah. who are you? And second, who are you to tell me <laughs> all this stuff, right? And he wasn't alone. Sorry, the phone just doesn't stop ringing. Yeah, no problem. The, um, uh, the other guy uh, was, and so and so Eric started to discredit me. And he immediately says, oh, Mark is a government agent. And he, he cannot be trusted. Literally, that was put out there four years ago. Matt Boylan did the same freaking thing. And they didn't talk about this on the on the documentary, really, where Eric or sorry, Matt wrote me. He Matt, out of all the people, he Matt. I will say this: his instincts are are pretty honed. You run into people like that where like they make terrible life decisions, but sometimes their instincts are really spooky. He uh -huh. was he called me when I had only done like Clue Eight, and he goes and literally, I mean, out of the blue, and he goes, "Why aren't you uh, returning my texts?" And I go, "Cause I don't have a cell phone." Uh, it was. I had a land. I had a landline. If you text somebody on a landline, it goes nowhere. It doesn't bounce back. It just goes nowhere. And uh, and then the first email he wrote me, and I still have it on my machine to this day. I put it on the cloud. He <laughs> said, uh, "Okay, here's what I want to start you to start. Okay, you, what you saw in the movie was absolutely true. Where people were calling me, and I felt it felt like high school. Where uh, it's like, oh, will your friend go to Sadie Hawkins with me? And people were calling me." <laughs> Seriously, yeah. and, and saying, it's like, so you're into Flat Earth, right? It's like, do you know how to get hold of Matt Boylan? I think he's cute. It's like, what? And, and so, and Matt was going, no interviews, no interviews. It's like playing that coy BS. And he, um, then he emails me, because now he realizes I'm doing interviews. And he says, okay, here's what I want you to start doing in your interviews. I need you to start attacking the Catholic Church. I'm going, what? <laughs> what? Why would I do it? He goes, especially the Jesuits. You got to attack the Jesuits, man. They're they're behind a lot of this. I'm going, no, I'm not going to do any of that. He goes, you don't do this. Same thing. And I will I will start to discredit you. I'm going, screw you. I'm not doing it. And sure enough, between mm -hmm. those two guys, they did so much damage. To this day, I get, I mean, literally to this day, four years later, I get comments every single day on my YouTube videos that say, you're a shill, even though they have no idea what the definition of shill is. Do you know what it is, by the way? Uh, it's like a stand-in for an organization, right? Like a Montanto shill? Yes, <laughs> yes. But it was initially from the old world uh, word shillaber, which is carnival's assistant. And if you're wondering where that comes from, it's like uh, that is the guy that – if you've ever been to a carnival, right? The guy that's doing the ring toss. He's got yeah. you know, three things for a buck, three throws for a buck, right? And you have a guy over behind you that says – this holding a giant panda bear saying, oh, I totally won this. It's a piece of cake. You got it. 
right? Yeah. And that guy works, of course, for, for that. And so people throw that, that term out there all the time. But you throw it enough, out there enough, and, you know, you repeat, and Hitler said it, you know, you repeat something loud enough and long enough, people will start, it will start to sink in. And so that's what, yeah. So I don't mind too much of it because I know where it came from. Uh, it, it, it annoys me to some degree to where I do not, I don't know if I said this in the movie or not, uh, I don't read comments much uh, yeah. because I want to sleep at night. Uh, yeah. the, old, the old saying it would used to be, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That's not true anymore. I know, especially online. Yeah, it's it, really it, yeah. if you can't say something yeah. nice, you're probably in the YouTube forums. I mean, seriously, I, 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 and I try, remember, part of what I do being a freshman recruiter is I try to keep people upbeat in the community. Because remember, like, like you said, you know, I don't like any emails and people yelling at me. Um, oh, my God, I get people all the time. It's like, Mark, help me. I'm getting just destroyed. And I go, you got to understand. I go, in the immortal wor words of Taylor Swift, haters going to hate, 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 <laughs> hate, hate, hate. Seriously, I could make a video. I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it. I could make a video of a puppy being chased by a kitten on a beautiful meadow of flowers and those two are being chased by a beautiful butterfly and you'll still have yeah and, no I, I and people will be like within i mean not even a couple hours people will be like this is effing gay thumbs down unsubscribe it's like right yeah. what you weren't even subscribed in the first place i don't care i'm just I, gonna say it yeah no totally anyway. um but so i guess on that yeah. i i think it Part, part, part of that is why I have trouble with conspiracy theories right. because right. you, I think anybody who's evaluating one. So when you come across one, mm -hmm. while arguments can be made that say that one person is, um, is doing something or that one organization is doing something that's negatively affecting people, then you have a, you could have the opposite organization making up that conspiracy, right? So the dis, for example, the disinfo theory. The disinformation, right? Yeah. So when I hear people, for example, talk about like the Sandy Hook shooting mm. and they talk about how the kids were stand-in actors, well, yeah. how do you know that that conspiracy wasn't sort of disinformation created by gun lobbies, right? Or other corporations sure. that stand a profit? And how do you know that like the 9-11 conspiracy videos right. weren't disinformation created by like the Taliban or Al-Qaeda in order to try to sow discord among people in the US sure. and how do you know? So how do you choose um, to believe or, or with vaccinations too? Right? right. So with vaccinations, you know, I mean, there's, it's, it's interesting because while there might be like some risks associated with any sort of medical procedure, right. um, the risks about vaccines, according to research right. are exaggerated and there's continual research studies from universities not from the pharmaceutical companies right. showing no link between autism and vaccines right. and these vaccines are important for not having measles outbreaks like we're having in dallas and california sure. and in other places sure. and so how i i guess so you know one of my concerns because my my research area is science communication you know i wonder like while i want people to be skeptical consumers of information for sure right. Um, from a person perspective, if you're evaluating information, how do you decide who's the malicious actor and who's the victim? Boy, that's a, that, that's one of the best questions I've gotten all year, and I know it's only March. Uh, but but okay, this kind of goes along with what we what we started with because somebody asked me recently uh, on an interview what defines a conspiracy theorist, and that is. It comes down to, and it's not even a straight line. What we we again, we all know there's lies, but what right. level of lies? We all draw that the imaginary line, which is, and and I used to think kind of it was like a straight line, but it's not. It's it's all it's all it's really bumpy, which is what lies we're willing to say. Oh yeah, they're lies, and everything everything on this side is a lie, and everything on that side is the truth, right? And it re that line really varies from person to person, and but it's a slippery slope. Like what you're saying, there is no, there is no definitive way to. Uh, there's there's no mathematical qualifier for what you're asking, meaning because it's, because people it it comes down oh how many environmental factors, you know. Well, how about you? like how do you choose, like for Sandy Hook, how do you choose between believing <laughs> the gun lobby's not responsible versus believing that the Sandy Hook thing wasn't fake? I play 
in most of the conspiracies, I play the odds. And but I'm different than most people. But you, you, a lot of no, conspiracy, but, but that's fine. You, I mean, I'll, let me compare myself to others. So other conspiracy people, they just like you know they don't. Once they get to a certain point of I don't trust this, I don't trust this. Eventually, it'll tip, and then they will be I don't trust anything. They look at everything with a skeptical eye, extreme skepticism, including their own people. It's like, you know, seriously, people right next to him, it's like, you better not do anything suspicious, even though we're on the same team, including me, you know, right. I, so, but for me, I put myself in, I, it's very, very different, which is how I got to do the flatter thing was I put myself in the side of the greater good, meaning mm -hmm. I put myself in, it's, it's like, okay, fine, it's a conspiracy. I turn the chessboard around and I say, why would you do that? Exactly. What 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 do you benefit? What what does the person on the other side benefit? So when I look at nine eleven or Sandy Hook or JFK or Pearl Harbor, every American war, I put myself in their shoes and it's like, okay, would I do this? And what is the cost? Does the end justify the means? Because that's really what it boils down to. I mean, come on. When it comes to the really big, dis sorry, what? Go ahead. Could you do the opposite though too? So you could say, you know, is it possible that this is true? Right? Does the end justify the means? Right. But could you also say, does creating the this conspiracy narrative is that also possible, possible. Is there oh, yeah 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 absolutely i mean disinfo come on we're talking about um uh, military intelligence 101 you know deception is a huge part of war uh and every spy i mean come on categorically it's such a weird paradox i mean categorically we don't even have spies even though we have a massive intelligence operation uh you know until a spy is caught we have no spies and it's like oh yeah we that spy we don't have any other spies you know, until the U-2 spy plane is shot down, blah, blah, blah. So when it comes to, yeah, could there be disinfo on multiple levels being perpetrated to do the exact opposite of what you're thinking? Sure, of course there could be. Uh, Sandy Hook, you, let's use Sandy Hook as an example. Well, you know what, let's do two real quick. Sandy Hook, uh, for me, was different because I look at it from probability standpoint. Uh, now, yeah, motivation, that's absolutely in question. You're absolutely right. Regardless of what you think of Sandy Hook, the motivation for Sandy Hook, that still to this day is, is really ethereal because people are, I'm still scratching my head. It's like, okay, who who really benefits? Yeah, you could say, okay, the gun people is a Republican versus Democrat thing. Is it a gun thing versus a non-gun thing? There's not a lot of things to choose from there. Or is it just a fear-based beat, which is it's a dangerous world out there. You need us, right? You know, it's it's Every, there's danger everywhere. Don't forget about us, you know, because if a society becomes too too complacent, then you know bad things can happen. Um, the vaccines, here, and I, I have to address this with you, which is think about it this way: the mob, the mob, the public needs a target, plain and simple. Doesn't matter if there isn't any scientific evidence, and I know this is going to sound really shallow and weird doesn't matter if there's really any scientific evidence to prove or not whether autism is connected with the vaccines in some way. Something is causing it. When the, va when the, when the autism rate goes from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 40, and I, don't even, I can't even do the math in my head right now, that's just a ridiculous, huge jump. It's got to be something, and the people want an answer. Right. Well, and they have answers. Well, there's a not, not, not the answers they want to hear, unless, unless it's the water, the food, or the air. Because it's not something that they can control, right? Now, I think one of the answers that I talked to when I was in graduate school, right. a person who studied right. autism, said actually online dating was a big one. If, if you um, try, by the way, if you try to publish that in the news, oh, you will get destroyed. <laughs> sure. I'm not, no, and I'm not, because this is not my research. Right, right. No, no, I'm just saying that that guy would never be able to, talk, to tell that story anywhere. Yeah, but this is but this is why. So the the idea is that autism is a spectrum disorder, right? It is not something that is like a you have it or you don't, sure. right? There's there's a, a, a you know a huge continuum, right. and when people are lower on the continuum, right. then right. they they're just the kind of slightly odd person, right. and that's probably true for most people in academia, right? Just the slightly odd person who who is a little socially awkward or whatever. Um, in small communities before online dating, right. those people may not necessarily find a partner right. to marry and have kids with. Right. For, like the weirder they get, the less likely they are to find a partner. You bring online dating into the mix, and now you have people finding matches who are more similar to them. 
and they call it broad autistic phenotype. And they say broad autistic phenotype plus broad autistic phenotype right. equals a child with a, a, a more severe case right. of autism. Right. And they tend to find larger um, uh, instances of autism in people who have more with what they refer to as like masculine brain type jobs. Sure. So people who are coders or, or computer engineers or um, mathematicians or physicists. And, um, and, and so it seems to be a sort of like exponential effect of genetics over time. Right. Um, but you're right. You can't control that really. Right. And so you, you don't have a person to blame for it. Um, I mean, that's, and, I, that's an interesting, that's an interest. I've never heard that one, obviously. Uh, and that's not bad. I, you know, I, I like, of course, you know, pinning the blame. Oh my God. It's because online dating is such a fluffy sort of internet topic trying to like, pin. Like, sorry, go ahead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily blame. And that's the thing. Like, I don't think it's to blame. Well, no, no. It's, remember the public wants yeah, to, to blame. blame the mob. This, this goes back to Rome. <laughs> The mob wants the head of somebody, and l let me let me throw this at you real quick, and uh, yeah. we we have time, which is unless you unless you want to bug out, which is I, I try the old saying is nine out of ten problems in the world revolve around money, and mm -hmm. think of it this way: when it comes to get remember the Robert De Niro thing was very interesting how he was going to release it, and they went to him and basically said your legacy will be destroyed. If you do this, uh, but wait, I know you're going to jump in. Think of it like this in the old days. Cause I'm older. The vaccines were very limited and you know, you know, probably know where I'm going with this, but, but, do, but the what? How old are you? Uh, 83. I'm uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm, uh, I'm 50. Okay. I'm 36. Oh. I'm, I'm young, but I'm not like, okay. Well, okay. So your, your vaccines would have been a little more, but not as, not as less as mine. I mean, I think we may have had like half a dozen back in the day. The thing with vaccines, like anything in, in America, America is basically the ones that screw everything up because we, we take it to the we take it too far always. And that is when pharmaceutical companies realize it's like, no, the program you really need to get into is vaccines. If you can get your drug into the vaccine regimen, you will make a huge amount of money on a regular basis. It is clockwork. It is guaranteed. Here's the problem. And, and it's a slippery slope because, okay, you know, this, this vaccine gets in and this vaccine, it goes from 10 to 20 to 30. And it doesn't sound like a huge jump, but then you're talking about chessboard math, which is, okay, back in the day, you only had to test these six versus these six and the eight blood types and two genders. And, you know, you could test this shit, right? But when you're talking about 30, you're talking about exponentially higher levels of testing and then you have a bigger problem which is if there is a problem you know and remember it's a rush to market not to pit, pit it on the scientists which is let's say you have a problem between vaccine two and vaccine seven in males under the age of three or whatever it is uh, maybe african-american maybe not right you have a guaranteed problem and you don't find this out until two years after it's already been to market and this is attorney's rules Right. The attorneys run the world to a lesser degree, which is the attorneys will tell you, it's like, no, you never, ever, ever admit guilt until they absolutely have you. And so if there is this drug, no, no, no co company, even if they know full well, there is a problem, a conflict between can say it because their company will be involved in class action and it'll be wiped out. It is gone. Your company is gone instantly. People protect their own at all costs. And I, and I would be the first one to say, look, I'm not going to talk about a conspiracy. I would have done the same thing. Look, if your lawyer comes to you, your lab comes to you and says, we have a problem with this and this. There's a new vaccine introduced in the market from this company over here. It's conflict with ours, and it causes this. What do you do? What do you do as a, inside that corporation? You protect your own. Plain and simple. There's nothing, there's, well, there's nothing else you can do. And no, and I agree with your logic there. But then the other question that, that I would have is, so while it's completely possible that if somebody found a problem with the vaccine, that particularly if it's owned by a company, that the company is going to try to cover that up. Totally, totally buy that. In what way, so let's assume right. from a public health standpoint right. that we're trying to avoid childhood diseases that, um, that kill children, yeah. right? Um, either kill or have severe problems, things like polio, um, measles, um, uh, others to that extent, right. diphtheria, pertussis. Um, in what situation could you develop treatments for that that don't have the problem of being part of a market in some way, particularly in a capitalist society? No, no, no. 
you're, you're right. And trust me, I have thought about the vaccine issue a long time, trying to think of, OK, what is there a, a broader solution to this? Because we're talking about something now that's not going to stop. This is not, you know, and I do believe in this and it's not it's not going to get better. Uh, I'll use the quick example of because people forget about the, the old stuff, even though it was only 20 years ago. Um, the reason why big tobacco went, you know, those massive lawsuits and lost wasn't because people were getting sick and dying, it had nothing to do with that. It was because the health insurance companies were footing the bill for freaking bronchitis and lung cancer and they were losing their freaking shirts. It was because the insurance, it was big money versus big money. The insurance companies went after tobacco. It wasn't the people. Oh, yeah, the people were on trial. It's like, oh, secondhand smoke and all this. No, it was the huge, massive health insurance lawyers. Compare that to now, there is no legal thing. There is no class action suit you can bring against the big pharma because there's one, you don't know which company it is. They can, you know, the labs are all controlled and you don't have any big money behind you. So the answer to your question, like how, how would you solve this? Uh, more extensive testing and transparency and somebody freaking falling on their sword. That, yeah. that would, that would be, mean, and I wish it, it would, I wish it was possible, but it's not. Would it help if, if it was, if vaccines um, or treatments for those types of disorders were not, um, now I know this is not going to happen, but like in a perfect world. In a perfect world. If, 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 um, if vaccines and treatments were developed by universities as opposed yes. to corporations. Yes. And, and um, hope to God what? that there's no corruption in that, because as you know, all it takes is one or two great people to. Well, so one thing that I hear a lot, that's, uh, that, uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, you may already know this, but one conspiracy about universities is that we'll perpetuate diseases and disorders because we get tons of money to, to try to solve them. Nah. We don't get that money. No, I don't, I, I don't. I don't buy it for a second. It's it's when things get privatized that, again, greed, greed, greed's one of the seven, one of the seven deadly, and there's a reason for it. Corporations always will take it too far, uh, you know, not to use the wolf on Wall Street example, but we don't know when to, men, especially women get a pass. Uh, men do not know when to stop. They just keep, there is no, you know, there is not enough, uh, nothing is too much money and power and, and greed again which is why the antarctic treaty thing let's circle back around to flat earth real quick which is yeah. why that was one of those things that just was a huge red flag for me which was wait a minute there's billions and billions and billions of dollars down there and nobody's going after it since when right you know we will frack in your backyard tomorrow if we can we will <laughs> cut you a check and we will be there uh and you're in fracking you know you, you've seen fracking right yeah, uh, but yet Antarctica is off limits and nobody even, and this is something they didn't even talk about in the documentary real quick, which is that nobody even is even objecting to it. So if I'm the head of British Petroleum, I would be running full page ads in the London Times every freaking month. How great it would be for us to go to freaking Antarctica. And they're not even allowed to talk about it. So something's happening at the highest level, which is like, yeah, national, call it national security, whatever. Sorry, back to your vaccine thing. In a perfect world, you're absolutely right. If a private company, basically private companies should stay out of vaccines entirely. You know what? There's your answer right there. I didn't even think about it till just now. If universities should develop vaccines, if if corporations want to help, they should do it for a non-profit region, a reason. I mean, if you want to donate money to a university to develop vaccines, which they all should anyway in a perfect world, they should and then not reap any benefits. When it's done for profit, people cut corners and they will do anything they can to maximize profits. Plain and simple. So would you consider, so would you say then, um, what do you think about capitalism versus other capitalism, organizations? It's not perfect, but it, it, it I, look, I, because I've had to look at this world and uh, had to break it down and see how many, because I've really, over the last four or five years, I've had to look at it from, okay, if I was going to build it, if I was going to revamp it or do, what would I do? Right now, capitalism, given what human beings are and the competitive nature, is the best show in town, which is why America, even though I have no idea why it's still standing compared, you know, after the 2008 crisis, it's still the best show in town because capitalism motivates people. You know, that sounds silly, but come on. We've all heard the stories of the Soviet Union, which isn't there anymore. Uh, so communism has its, has its aspects, right? Mm -hmm. But capitalism drives people. It, it gets mm -hmm. people off their asses and and it's like, look, how many things we developed and invented because of capitalism? Tons. 
So then is it is it one of those things where because of the capital na uh, capitalist nature of society, right. um, the sort of error rate for using that, right? So it's got all these benefits in terms of developing new products and, you know, people are motivated, right, right. Um, to, to create new things. And then there's competition between products. Right. Um, we, we sort of accept as the error rate the fact that in some circumstances at some levels, um, there's going to be lying, cheating, and stealing, and that there's going to be this sort of distrust of the organizations creating these products yes. because of the lying, cheating, and stealing. Yeah, and everybody knows, unless you're super, super naive, everybody knows that anyway. Look, corporations, there's a reason why there's a, there's a term called corporate espionage, right? People will, yep. in fact, every story I ever hear nowadays where it's like, oh, there was a mouse found in McDonald's or is there a mouse found in Qdoba? It's like, all right, somebody, you know, because there's no reason that story should even be there, right? But corporations hate each other. You know, they it's ruthless. Uh, it, sports carries straight over to corporations. There's really not very much difference there. Um, what I'm saying is, is that eventually, uh, I shouldn't say decency isn't even the right word, the greater good and the ability to hit the brakes at least temporarily and say, look, do give back, you know, mm -hmm. you got this far, give back to the society that got you that far. Uh, don't keep asking for more and more tax breaks. You know, you, you got enough. And look, how many yachts can you own? I don't care if your private jet is two years old. Right, you don't need another freaking private jet right now. You, but I, but again, that's kind of hypocrisy because we teach people that's what you should shoot for. But to a certain level, right? Yeah. So, do you believe those corporations and the government kind of check each other? Check each other or work with each other? They're bis basically the same thing now. Um, well, Eisenhower's military-industrial yeah. complex was once once right. that so, merged. I mean, that didn't even happen. Corporation ever since the '60s. That's what he helped build. He hated the fact that he did it, and he warned everybody. I mean, talk about the weirdest, you know, uh, what, what do they call it, um, address uh, when he's leaving. Whatever. He was leaving office, right? And his last speech was, watch out, because there's something coming. But, but that was natural anyway. The corporations, once the, mil you know, the government started working with these corporations, you know, the meetings go hand in hand. But realistically, you could have corporations that aren't being invited that get jealous and try to attack or call that out. Yes. And then you have different political parties that, I mean, the uh, in some ways, unfortunately, the government isn't super unified, right? There's all these different things. <laughs> Not and they're super always unified. That's a kind way of saying it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so it's it's hard for the gut. We talk, I know I talk about the government as often as this one thing, but right. um, it's, you know, a lot of separate pieces that fight amongst one another and in some ways make it completely defective. Right. Um, but so in that sense, different corporations and different parts of government are, are working at odds with one another at different times. So yes. while you may say that like the Republican party traditionally, maybe not, um, moving forward, but traditionally, um, has been in combination with, uh, military industry right. to, to combine those two, but then you're getting pushback from like other types of industry as well as from within like uh, more progressive or liberal um, parties. So that's sort of what I mean by the checking on yeah, each other. They don't check each other that I mean, yeah, and some levels really comes into layers, which is once you get past the, the layer of quibbling between Democratic and Republican, I mean, come on, the Simpsons did an episode on this years ago called the Kang and Kodos episode, where uh -huh. it didn't matter who you were voting for. And really, that is that was also a matrix line, which is yeah. There's the illusion of choice, which is, yeah, you vote for this guy or this guy. Then you are identified with this guy and this guy. If something went wrong, I'm going to blame it on Obama. If something went right, I'm going to blame it on Trump and vice versa. Right. Uh, but when you get up to the highest level, that doesn't make any difference. In fact, here, here's a great line I, I throw at people every once in a while, which is, let's say you have, you're a billionaire right now. Right. And I don't care. I don't know what your leanings are. We'll just pretend that was you, I don't know. And so you have a billion dollars. Who do you donate to in the next election? And then, you know, do you go Republican or Democrat? And and then you, you get into, you know, just, well, because I'm into, you know, this these sort of rights, I'm, you know, Democrat. Or I because I'm this corporate thing, I'm going to go Republican. I go, no, 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 no. You're going to donate to both. Because, remember, at the highest levels, the politicians do not care where the money comes from. And they don't care if you wrote checks to both sides. You're hedging your bets. Either way... And if you spend enough money, you actually get enough, an audience with this person, not just, you know, a, a pick that you can put on your on your mantle, right? You and the president, you can actually influence policy. And if you're really rich, 
you can influence policy quite a bit. And you're saying, okay, Mark, what's your point? My point is, is that you were a multi-billionaire to do this. And this is not to make you sad. But if you're not a multi-billionaire, what exactly are you voting for? I mean, your, vo- yeah. your vote, now, come on, everybody knows. I mean, com- especially after the, after the last thing. No offense, because I don't vote either way. I've never voted in my life. But come on, we elected a reality television star as president of the United States. That was a movie idea some years ago and now people you know idiocracy which i thought was yeah. the silliest movie ever and now and people are watching us going it's prophetic so anyway no um well and so that i i think a lot of that comes down to policy too so you have um the uh that supreme court judgment about corporations being people i can't remember what the name of it is but so they have a voice so like right. being right. able to donate money and and also the difference so popular vote versus, yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it's very interesting and there's a lot of stuff. Um, so I apologize uh, for asking, do, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. I know we've been sort of talking. Oh, no, too, no, but... no, it's okay. And and I, just, you know, I won't, I won't, I will send you the audio recording of this. I won't put it, I'm not going to put it up anywhere. Uh, it's just, it's just you and me. Um, right. The, uh, no, I don't have too many questions. I was just, it was curious to me because I've seen it so many times because I have to follow the media now and, and see what, right. what they're talking about. And I saw your story and I can't remember who first broke it. Uh, the Guardian. The Guardian? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And of course, it was a perfect example because people love grabbing the Guardian stuff. And then it just started spreading from there and, yeah. and different versions of it. And I thought that was very curious. And it's like, really? Uh, but but I knew I knew where your head was at, kind of. Well, that's good. And no, no, I know nobody, nobody in the, the Flyers community. I, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but most people don't think anything of it. It's like because it's obvious to us. We look at it in that in that other thing. It's like, well, yeah, YouTube is where we are. You know, it's it's not. But at the same, I just think it's really interesting. It's it's it's, you know, I think it's interesting that there's a community that sort of like is is based in YouTube and in that sort of method of communication. But I wasn't trying to blame. Oh YouTube no, no, it. and and of course. Or saying course. that there should be censorship. No. I wasn't saying that. Either. Part of me kind of wants uh, to be because we're being kind of painted ever since the the documentary kind of be painted as villains uh, recently, which is fine. I don't mind that. You know, villains are, are good characters anyway. Look, people, there's a reason why there's villains in stories. You know, you need a protagonist and an antagonist. And this thing has, if, if they turn it, if they use your article to, 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 to do more of a villain stuff, it's like, well, we got to do something about YouTube. I don't think they're, they're going to be addressing it anytime soon because they just addressed it recently, which was weird. Yeah. When, in fact, when did, you, yeah. when did you do your study? Um, well, like I said, my study had nothing to do with that line that they grabbed out. My study was just evaluating the different types of arguments oh. that you guys made and seeing how they resonated with different people. And then I had mentioned along the reason why we were doing this with YouTube videos was because it's a YouTube-based community. And they took um, that one line and blossomed it into they took a... That one line and it became a whole thing. Wow. Um, and... Well, good for you in some ways. I mean, in some ways that's better than being published because it's like, hey, look at that. Well, well, in some way, it depends, right? Who do I want respect from? It's not helpful among my community members because it's like one line taken out of context of that. But um, anyway, the uh, yeah, so you're right. YouTube had had just sort of uh, addressed their algorithms, and I I don't think that they should censor people. I also have a hard time with the algorithms. I I think if I was going to blame anything for bad stuff, yeah. generally, it would be algorithms. And it would be less for, like, the propagation of misinformation as much as the sorting us into different groups. Right. So we're not likely to see inf- – and this is particularly true for Facebook, right. less for YouTube. Right. For Facebook, when our news feed shows us things it thinks we're most likely to like and engage with, which is often things that we agree with because we have this thing called confirmation bias, right? right? We only like to look at information that confirms our existing views, not stuff that disconfirms it. Generally speaking, there are, there's variance in that. Um, so our Facebook walls tend to, and, and like I, I, at this conference I was just at where they, where they picked up this line, right. um, there, there was a computer scientist who had run, run these different models of information um, uh, diffusion through, through um, online networks like Twitter right. and Facebook. And it found that like in any version of the system that people are allowed to choose who they're friends with and to disconnect from people they don't want to be friends with, right. information is going to end up in these echo chambers if they're using algorithms. And so it's just like, 
uh, it, it's frustrating because then people aren't getting all the information, right? You want people to get all the information it's true. and, and they're, they're cultivating and sorting information in ways, um, where they're, they're, they're sort of maximizing our biases kind of against us. It's yeah. In, in it's like, it's creating, uh, for lack of a better term, it's cre it's building an echo chamber around them while it's happening slowly, but surely it just keeps you know, yeah. brick by brick until finally right. it's, you're inside it. Yeah. And we're already likely to do that anyway. Right. So it's like, we're likely to, you know, if you're liberal, you watch MSNBC. If you're conservative, you watch Fox news. I mean, we already sort of sort ourselves that, that way, right. but yeah. instead of helping make it better. So we're more likely to see information, even if it is conflicting with our existing views. Right. Now right. we're less likely to see it and it's showing us more and more extreme information. And, and I agree that there's a problem with the media. I, I think that, um, I think the media serves a necessary and important component yeah. to to our society, but I think that, you know, while I like the idea of a of a user based media thing as well, right? So not just relying on certain organizations to report, right. um, having many people report. One of the the negative sides of that is that you have people who are not. Um, held to the same sorts of norms and standards that that we do in media and and there's been this sort of default to create clickbait right making the title of the article researcher blames youtube is clickbait yep. you know um that in fact the guardian's article generally was was pretty accurate right. um in terms of what i was saying but the title um, because that's all and, that matters they they know that people there is no time to skim articles anymore. The title is yeah. your your only shot. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a so. there's a great. I should send you a video if I get a chance. There was something of all things. It was a movie review place on on YouTube called Red Letter Media, and there was a guy that coined a term. Uh, I, I it's not popular. It's called the blurring effect, which I thought mm -hmm. was very very interesting. Where he said that it, it, what I talked about earlier, media has gotten so broad, it is so huge and so many you can't even begin. So right. the only way that corporations can break into this is to redo. That's why you see so many reboots. It's not because it, it's like your only chance the project may work is if you can call back to an earlier memory for these people. And so which is what so they're rebooting every franchise that they can. And for the first time ever, you're seeing encore performances of television shows. That's never happened in the history of television. And that's because, well, yeah, I remember Will and Grace. Well, how about some more Will and Grace episodes? Wait, we're, we're, didn't they canceled like eight years ago? It's like, yeah, yeah, we'll bring them back and so on and so on. Um, and to that effect, Flat Earth, one of the reasons why Flat Earth has done so well is Flat Earth is the ultimate uh, knife against the blurring effect because everybody knows the term, which I think is fascinating. Think of it this way. I, of all the people you've talked to and all the people you, you see online, it's like Flat Earth, love it or hate it, probably the most polarizing thing ever, right? I have never run into a person ever out of thousands and thousands and thousands of people that said, Flat Earth, never heard of it. Right. Yeah. Everybody knows it. It's the only thing we debunk to children, which even though we don't say it, you know, but I'm sure all the teachers like we used to believe in the Earth is flat. Now it's the globe. Here it is, children. I'm going to put this off in the corner. It's going to sit there for the next 12 years. And that's and that's it. I mean, see, I mean, we don't tell kids about JFK or 9/11 or any of that other stuff. We only tell them about that. I thought that was again conspiracy within a conspiracy. Yeah. Well, in part, I think it's sort of um, an interesting history on the conflict between religion and science. Yeah. Um, the end, the ever never-ending war between religion and science. But they can be compatible. They can. <laughs> it's thing. funny you'd mention this, and again, uh, yeah, then I'll have to wrap this up in a bit because I get ready for the next yeah. one. But there was—I uh, had a chance to um, do a debate down in Los Angeles with a guy named Jeff Zwernick. Was Zwernick. He's an astrophysicist down at uh, UCLA, I think, and he's also a very strong Christian, mm -hmm. which is weird. You know, he's—he is not loved in the community because he preaches both. He goes to church every Sunday, and he tries—he's—he's he's trying desperately to merge the two. He's saying science and and religion can work together, and. Uh, Have you heard of Catherine Hayhoe? Who? Catherine Hayhoe. No. She's a climate scientist and an evangelical Christian. And she's kind of going down that same road. Yeah, she's here in Lubbock. She met with the Pope and Leonardo DiCaprio and like was is part of the group that works on climate science research and is, 
you know, her husband is an evangelical preacher and she's a very strong and she has tons of conspiracies about her. I know. And she always gets angry emails as well. Did you ever <laughs> see, okay, I'll end on this. I swear to God. Um, which is because you mentioned the Pope and Leonardo DiCaprio, and I don't think it's, it's an accident. I think it's synchronicity because that's part of, it's a weird part of my speech for 2019. Uh -huh. Did you know about the, so you knew, you know, again, if you're, I know there are people who are very interested in, in climate science, like the Pope, right. Put out the papal encyclical right. and Leonardo DiCaprio was really interested in environmentalism. That's why I mentioned those two. Well, no, it's, it's fascinating though. Cause literally three weeks ago I was talking, I used slides of Leonardo DiCaprio and the Pope on, on my screen behind me. Right. But here's the weird thing. You probably don't know this when he, cause remember if you're an A-lister, right. A-lister, you will still only get 15 minutes with the Pope at the Vatican, you know, I mean, That's and so he's there. And you're thinking, oh, 15 minutes, right? You're going to talk about it, climate change? I know there's probably backroom things and whatever. But he opens up a book of artwork from 500 years ago and shows him. And, and it was on video. And I'm, I'm watching this back in 2016. I was going, what the hell is he doing? He shows him um, uh, an image. It's called the, uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. It's a flat enclosed world map. And he shows, <laughs> it, he shows it to him. And he says, he goes, I, he goes, this hung above my crib as a child. He goes, and to me, it represents the promise of the future and enlightenment. It's like, and I'm watching this, right? And I got friends that are watching. I'm going, I don't know what this means. What does this mean? <laughs> is this is this a thing? You, if you haven't seen it, you really ought to. It's fascinating. Uh, and then after that, you know, that pope met with the Orthodox Russian pope first time in a thousand years, and that guy went down to Antarctica for no apparent reason whatsoever. It's like, why is he down there? Unless it was, you know, you could say it was climate change. Maybe it was. John. Yeah, there's a lot of climate research that goes on at Antarctica. Oh, I'm sure there is. So it's, it's different. Well, and it's different. Um, what's interesting about the 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 ice melting patterns are different yeah. for the Arctic versus the Antarctic right. because the Arctic doesn't have land under it. Right. It is just ice, and Antarctic does have rock and land underneath yeah. it. So the melting rates are different, and so anyway, it's interesting. interesting. But, so what are your uh, what are you doing now? You just kind of you doing your Today? I mean no just I mean moving research. forward with your with your research are you doing anything interesting I'm trying to write the well I'm trying to write the YouTube paper which again is just sort of um you know which arguments are resonating with different kinds of people and then um I have the interview paper which I'm working on which just talks about again in some ways it's you know I I viewed the movie as a positive thing for the flat earth community it was. because I think yeah because I think it shows Again, it, it 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 disconfirms the myths that that it's a, a bunch of people who are trolls, right. or or who are paranoid, right. or who are science illiterate. Right. And right. and so I, I think that that those are kind of like the three um, myths about the flat Earth community, um, and and honestly about any sort of community that denies a form of science. Right. Um, and, and it's just like, no, it, the problem is that people are interpreting information through their worldview lenses. And so some information is going to seem accurate to them and some information is going to seem not accurate right. to them. And how do we, how do we sort of, how do we work with that? Right. So how do we, if we know what we're doing, like we can right, so we can trust ourselves. We know we're doing this research. We really believe that this research is important and is meaningful and should be known. How do we try not to become <laughs> the, you know, to a shill in a conspiracy right. or how do we, um, you know, like, you know, I work with tons of climate science researchers. I know there's a ton of people who deny climate change. You know, they're really doing their work. They have their data, they have their evidence, they have what they've been doing. And um, they're not like, you know, and, oh, no, and, and just, just so you know, climate change is real. I, and there's a lot of flat earthers that say it's not. No, for me, it's absolutely real. Because again, if it's, if it's enclosed, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, it, and is is it just human based? Well, I mean, it's absolutely human based. Well, I mean, in some ways, it is enclosed, right? And so, um, even whether you think it's enclosed by like a firmament, right. sort of like a, a hard thing, or by the atmosphere. Right. Uh, right. So, Catherine Hayhoe, when she describes, um, you know, how climate change works, she talks about the process of, you know, we do have a somewhat porous atmosphere, and um, you have carbon. Um, being created in here and it's like this push pull through and I'm not a climate scientist right, So right. I don't but it's like this push through but then when you start creating more in um, it, it ends up making it harder to leave mm. and um, I wish I could remember her her oh, I, got um, you. I got you yeah, but anyway, so it traps it in and we're, we're ending up like um, 
like sitting in in our own heat. Yeah. Um, Sa same. So, anyway, same thing in my model. Absolutely. You know, no no different than. Uh, what was that? We had a we had a, a problem with connection there. Oh, no but I, I know you need to go. Uh, yeah. Sa sa same same sort of thing in my model. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's just that whatever the automated systems that are trying to work with this atmosphere, they're having a problem because what we're generating. Come on, we get seven billion people. You know how many? Every car is a furnace. They yeah. Never get and the what? Cow burps. Cow burps. Oh yeah, cow burps. Right. Cow burps are like one of the weirdest things. Like it, it it's a huge um and trash burning. Like oh. all the things that we do, we just yeah. We yeah we, we're we're not kind to the whole thing. Anyway, it was lovely yeah. speaking with you. Yeah, um, nice to you too. If uh, if something else comes up, or if you want to, if you need me for anything else, feel free to to reach out. If you need anybody else in the community, if for some mm -hmm. reason I don't care who it is, I'm pretty much wired in. So if you can think of somebody, just say, hey, I've been trying because some of these guys are really tough at getting back to people, mostly because of suspicion. Uh, if I vouch yeah. for whoever it is, oh, it's like, oh, they're fine, you're fine, it's oh, okay. So I uh, be feel free. Great. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate All it. Right, have a good day. All right. okay.